Welcome to Business Brains in the Bottom Line. My name is Paul Delegro, your host today, and I have a uh, an author on another author on today, Joe Parento, the author of Billion Dollar Sales Secrets. You can get it on Amazon. A little cheap plug there for you, Joe. Hey, thank uh, you very much. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here, and uh, thanks thankful for uh, being able to join your show and your audience today. No, it's great. So uh, obviously, you know I'm in sales, so it's a subject that's near and dear to my heart, and a lot of sales books out there, Joe. Absolutely, too you know? many. I've read a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, I have too. I have too. I'm not sure they're worth much, but uh, you know, it, it is what it is. So, but before we get into the book, I, I kind of I was looking at your bio, and you get a pretty interesting background. The most interesting part of that is you are the first generation to live outside an Indian reservation. So that has got to be a huge part of who you are. It is. Right? It's um, and it's something that, you know, outwardly, it's not the first thing that people see because they have, you know, a perception of how Native Americans, indigenous people look. I don't look like someone from Dances with Wolves. So, you know, I, I trim my hair and I'm kind of clean cut. Yeah. Uh, it's been that way ever since I joined the military. I've kind of always ha- kept it uh, nice and short. But yeah, my, my name is Ozal Makwa, uh, and I'm a member of the Little Shell tribe of uh, Anishinaabe, Chippewa, Cree of northern Montana. And my dad grew up uh, in a place called Box Elder, right near Rocky Boy Indian Reservation. Uh, so I'm the first in my family, uh, not only to go to college, but to kind of grow up outside of that that area. And it's been um, it's been interesting. Yeah, I can imagine adjusting to certain things that people just take for granted. Sure. Um, but it's uh, it's fun. Like whenever I go back to Montana, I find myself talking a certain way and uh, assimilating. Right? Yeah, assimilating. Right. That's sales, though. Sales, exactly. Right? You know, mirroring. It's called mirroring, right? So I've learned a lot uh, through that, and it's um, and it's helped me tremendously. I th- I think it's it's been a real benefit in sales. Yeah, we're all, you know, byproduct of our, of our environment, right? I think everything influences us. You often wonder. I often think of that. If I grew up in a different environment, who would I be today? Hmm. Yeah, you, it's a tough question because you never know. Yeah, it's um, and you've got to take all those experiences and your background and your history and and run with it, uh, and recognize that you're you're truly unique. And there's no one else like you. So let's jump right into it, Joe. You know, I've had an author on before, and I've actually done a couple of couple of authors. So why'd you write the book? What possessed you to write? You're a busy guy. You're you're a pilot. You you do a lot of different things, and you, and you wrote a book. What was uh <laughs> What was the genesis of that? Well, in sales, as you know, you know people will say things, and you can take them and believe them. And over a period of years, I've had probably as as far back as like 15 years ago, I had somebody say, oh, I've never experienced someone in sales who does this like you do. And it was from a customer. And I was like, yeah, you're just unlucky, I guess. <laughs> so you sort of just take it and, you know, you're, you're proud, but you're, you don't really believe it. And I've always been a voracious reader of every other sales book that's out there. I mean, I've read so many. I try and read, you know, one book a month, uh, just in general. And so I, as I went through my career, I had other people tell me, partners, customers, you know, coworkers, hey, you should write a book. It wasn't until I surpassed a goal of selling a billion dollars in a five-year span that I really started to believe myself and said, maybe I know something about selling that I could offer other people. Okay. And so I set out to write the sales book that I wish existed when I started my sales career that, um, that includes some stuff that uh, I've never seen in sales books before. Like, what do you do if you're successful? How do you deal with sales managers uh, and some other things like, you know, mindset. Right. So any part of the process surprise you? Was it easier, harder than you thought? What uh, What do you think? I would encourage everyone to write a, write a book. I think we all have stories inside of us. And the magical thing about writing a book, once I decided that I was going to do it, I just, I jumped all in and said, I'm going to, I'm going to write this book, is I sat back and you would think that it starts off with, you know, hey, it was a dark and stormy night. You know, it starts <laughs> off with your story. It yeah. really doesn't because it started me thinking about who I wanted to reach from an audience standpoint. And it made me question everything that I knew about sales. So I put a whole bunch of post-it notes on the wall of everything that I thought I knew. And I started researching probably for about a year uh, into what I was going to write about and who I sure. was going to reach out to. And that impacted you know, what I what I produced in the book. And so people uh, who know me, they initially would, would think, oh, this is going to be something about you. 
and I think a lot of people are surprised to find out that it's it's more about the reader. I try and open up the book so people can go on their own self-discovery. Yeah, you know, and I think I did read this somewhere in the book that uh, even though this is a sales book, it's for non-sales people as well because I think you made the comment, we're all sellers and we're all buyers too. Right. Right? Yeah, and we've all had good salespeople. I mean, one of the things that I kind of laugh about is that some people who get into sales, they think, and I've seen a couple of people do this, they think that they should emulate what they know a salesperson is. So I've had people who've sales managed me who decided to go watch, you know, Boiler Room or Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> <laughs> and then they come yeah. in there the next day and they're like, coffee is for closers. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, what did you just do? You, you're, you're emulating what you think is the way yeah. professional salespeople should be. And there's, there's too much of that. So I decided to to set the record straight and, and put some other other alternative approaches that people yeah. could could look at. So, what would you say your style is? If you you know, and I in the book you have like a dozen secrets. We, we don't have enough time to go through all of them, right? Right. But if you had to kind of pick the top two, three, you know, what is your style? Because everyone has a style. Some people are relationship sellers. Some people are really technical sellers. Some people, it's just everyone's different, and or some people are hybrids, right? So what's what's your style, mm-hmm. and what are the what are the kind of the secrets that you want to share in this book? One of the things that I have equated selling to be like, it's like playing chess on six different chess boards while you're balancing the chess boards. It's really, it's something that's complex and it's hard to explain to people who may not be from a selling background. Right. Uh, but uh, when you get into sales, there's a lot of complexity, there's a lot of ambiguity. You learn to think on your feet. And I'd say that the style that I've ad- adapted to has been based on my curiosity. And, and I, I think of things as puzzles that you try and figure out. So I'm insanely curious. I uh, am strategic. I'm relational, but I'm also, I borrow from some of the great people. Like, you know, you look at Brian Tracy oh, and yeah. some of the people who teach closing secrets. <clears throat> the, the need for that isn't the same as it used to be, but it's helpful to go, you know, study what Dale Carnegie did and what Brian Tracy had, had reached out and shared. Because that helps inform engagement. And really what, you, what I do is I build value with customers. I, I try and align value. And anyone who's bought or, or, or sold anything, you'll realize the great salespeople in your life. You'll say, okay, that's somebody who really helped me make a decision. I was better because of that person. Right. And conversely, we all know the people who are horrible. Yeah, it's funny you say that. You know, we have customers that, you know, we'll get engaged with a customer and they'll say, I'm just sick of salespeople that just sell me stuff and run. Right. And, you know, so, uh, you know, you're, drive in te- by. You're, you're in technology <laughs> sales as am I. So if you just sell stuff and run, you're not going to last very long at that customer. If you can't add value and help them design and architect a solution that's going to work today and be scalable in the future, you're going to be in trouble. I always tell people selling is something we do with others, not yeah. to them. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Because it is, it is. And we always tell people, you know, we're part of your team. Mm-hmm. Once we get engaged, once we build that trust, we become part of your team. We're an extension. We're sitting in on staff meetings. We're helping you, you know, discuss solutions that are going to help you the whole bit, not just, you know, sell stuff and, you know, call us when you need us. And one of my first mentors in sales, her name was Lorraine. I I'm an accidental salesperson. I wanted to be in politics, and I thought I was going to be in PR. I had gone for an interview yeah. in Portland, Oregon, with the mayor at the time. Her name was Vera Katz. And I walked into the office. Her and her aides were barefoot. Um, I looked around, and they were like, hey, you know, we can pay you about $10,000 a year. And I just kind of furled my brow, and I was like, okay, well, my student loans are about six times that. So, <laughs> so I'm like, it's well, going to take me a while to get out of this hole. Yeah. And the vibe was just weird, and I was like, okay, this isn't right. But I had an electrical engineering degree and a communications degree. I talked to Lorraine, and she said, sales is all about helping people get what they want or need. And to me, that was a drop-the-mic moment um, yeah. that she just had an indelible imprint on me because I thought about it, and I was like, okay – yeah, I think she's right. I can look myself in the mirror every day and approach selling as something honorable, yeah. something that I'm doing to help people. And that's what I've done. Even to this day, I, first thing I do, I wake up, I look in the mirror, I'm like, I'm going to help someone today. Yeah. No, that's a great point, by the way. I think if more people put the customer's needs first, mm-hmm. 
your needs are going to be taken care of in the end. But that's really kind of my mindset too. What, you know, if I'm gonna, I got to help the customer. Not, geez, how much can I, how much can I make off this deal today? It's just short sighted. Yeah, and I found too, whenever you're focused on like the numbers and the metrics, sometimes people will not come into sales because of that. But it's all wrong. If you focus on the customer, the metrics kind of work themselves out. And in, in landing, you know, a billion dollars in five years, I had a metric of, you know, at one point I started out with like 240 million a year, 350 a year, 420 million a year. That's a couple million a day, you know, when you take all the selling days. And yeah. to just sit back and contemplate, what does that look like? It's I it's, can't, it's scary. I can't imagine because <laughs> there's not many people around that did a billion dollars in sales. I can tell you that right now. That's yeah. just not. And it's, um, you know. It, to, to be honest, it all wasn't me, but it was me getting the number and saying, here's here's the people who I have to activate and bring on board to sure. help me. And uh, anyone else is looking at doing stuff, you know, you, you've got to realize sales is a full contact sport. You can't do it on your own. You've got to bring people in the boat with you to help you get there. And um, and you got to be willing to help customers, you know, align the, align the value to what they want. No, I com- completely agree. I, and another thing, you know, you're getting me thinking of all these cliches now. That, you know. <laughs> but one, there's a couple things I try to live by, you know, and I try to. I always said a customer's not going to buy from you unless he trusts you, likes you, respects you, or a combination of those three. Uh, because once you can get to that point, then then it becomes a real great opportunity to sell because. Now you you've got you've gained their trust, and until you do something different to destroy that trust, you should be in good shape at that point. And that's when sales is fun to me. I don't want I never have enjoyed doing commodity sales. Right. You know, I need fifteen of these. Okay, you, you can call. Yeah, you can get those online. Right. <laughs> you know, that's. But yeah, and even people who may be in commodity sales or something like that, you don't have to be commoditized. Right. You can you can choose to shine differently than others in your industry, and guess what that'll do? That'll set you apart from everyone else. It'll make you, it'll make you money. It'll endear you to customers, and that's what people want. People want to know, you know, I could go out and buy, you know, office paper and supplies from anyone, but when someone comes and they sell me and they and they're like, you know, hey, have you considered how? this is actually better for the type of printer that you have and some of the things that you're working on. You know, you want some acid-free paper uh, to put your, you know, your book plates in uh, because that's going to last longer. That's going to help you make a better connection to your readers. Yep. This is a great example of a salesperson who sold me on the value and the outcome. They look yeah. beyond just selling me a ream of paper. Yeah, no, complete, completely agree. And you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer in regular cadence with customers too that, you know, not just... What's the other gripe you hear about salespeople? Yeah, you sales guys are all like you're only here when there's a PO, right? Right. Well, I, I believe you have to be there for the good, the bad, and the ugly too, right? So they realize, okay, he, when when it hits the fan, he's going to have my back. That's one of the things where you know, be, from a indigenous, you know, Native American background, we think of time differently. So time is is this circular concept, not linear. You know, so when we think of the linear concept of time, you okay. start one here, start here, but in a sales cycle, thinking of this as a circular pro- progress, you mentioned you know you're only there when the PO is is available. If you think of, hey, every sale that I win, that's the start of another sales cycle. That's the start of something bigger or right. an opportunity to grow or spin off into three or four different sales. Uh, for me, that came naturally, but that was something that I didn't realize was a different way of thinking. I didn't realize that I thought this way, and so for me. Getting the follow-on sale and the sale after that was no big deal. One of the biggest sales in my life that I landed was a sale where I had a great initial win. Everyone was celebrating. They were like, oh, this is unbelievable. But as soon as I did that, I went and looked for the next one. And while my competitor was sleeping, I picked their pocket and we we got that business because everyone was just focused on this deal that we won and they lost. And I was like, okay, time to, time to move on to the next. I'm not going to bask in success because there's more out here. And I think that that's a really important thing to, yeah. to think about for people is that you're you're not defined by what you've done in the past. You're defined by your you know your best next thing and and there's tons of potential to help people out there and what are you going to do next? Yeah, no, completely agree. It's especially in sales, right? You know, it's a it's a monthly quarterly driven business and you could 
break world records last quarter. It's, okay, it's a new quarter. What have you done? Right. What have you that's, done for me lately? That's it's just always... the nature of the beast. It's it's not for everybody. As right. you, some, I know some people that have jumped into it and got back out. They're like, I, I don't have the stomach for this. I can't take the pressure every you know every week, every day, pipeline calls and qu- quarterly business reviews and all that other stuff. Yeah, I love it because if you like having a role where things change every day and there's opportunities to learn something every day, there's opportunities to travel, meet, meet new people, solve problems. It's a great profession. And I, a lot of people overlook it and they, they really, you know, uh, to their detriment. Yeah. And that's the reason why I got in too, by the way, I, lo- I wanted, I wanted the freedom to kind of do what I do what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Right. So you can run your business however you want really. Right. And so I, I like the flexibility of being able to work from home, work on the road, go visit customers versus I was never, I was never going to be a nine to five guy. I knew that early on in my career. Right. You know, so. Well, it's one of the, you know, when you look at the Fortune 500 and the CEOs, like 75% of them have been in sales roles in the past because it provides you that that real broad understanding of a company to help solve problems and diagnose and, and correct and fix. Okay. So like I said, in, in your book, you have like a, a ton of these secrets. Mm-hmm. We'll call them secrets. Um, so let's dive into a few of those. I mean, what, what are your, what are you, I'm looking at the list right now. Uh, what are the ones you want to talk about? Wh- which ones are the, the top secrets that, that you're going to share just here today with our audience? Yeah, there's a couple that make the, uh, the book interesting. Like I said, this is something I wish I would have read. Um, the, uh, the one that a lot of people gravitate toward is sales managers suck. They, uh, yeah, I, honestly, that was one I was hoping you'd bring up, right? I was going to let you talk about that. That's a good one. Okay, let's... But, uh, but yeah, in a sales book, I've never read about the seller relationship with their managers and their, and their, and their chain of leaders. But uh, a lot of people will gripe about their leaders, and, and some people will be like, you know, I've got the best leaders around. The important part is, as a sales professional, think about these relationships the same way you would customer relationships. A lot of people who are complaining, oh, my sales manager is horrible. Well, have you taken the time to plan for your sales engagements with that manager? Have you taken the time to prep, to come with insights, to offer something to help them out the same way you would your customers? And so people adopt this two-tiered view yeah, that, oh, my, that. my relationship with you know, my manager is different than my customers. No, it's, it's the same thing. You know, they, you're, yep. you're meeting a need, you're solving problems, you're delivering value, and that's, that's kind of one of the keys to that. Um, you got to manage that relationship. That's a big. That's a big one. I, I hear that from a lot of guys that you know th- their bosses have a tough reputation. Reputation, but they don't seem to have a problem because, like you said, on their weekly reviews, they're prepared. They're ready. So they, you know, it is. It's the guys that don't show up prepared. They they get themselves in trouble. Yeah, and it's um, you want to be in business, and I love what you said about you know, hey, it's it's managing my own business, and a lot of people have. Uh, that entrepreneurial spirit as a, as a salesperson to run your own business. And when I'm getting into business with people, I want to know that I can trust them, that I can respect them. And that's how you bring that respect is how you show up. So that's one secret. The other secret that's interesting, I put at the end of the book is what do you do if you're successful? I'd never seen that in a sales book. And this one's interesting because I blew it in my sales career big time. Whenever you get that taste of success, uh, you know, what do you do? Well, I know what I did. I went out and just blew all my money. Yeah, I was going to say, bought a boat. And started a buying and, cars and, yeah. you know, vacation homes and all this stuff. Everyone's done that once in their life, though. Anyone who's made any money, especially guys like you. I grew up in a poor Italian family. Right. We, we had no money. So when I started making money, I did some things. It's like you did, too. I mean, just nat- I think that's natural. Why do you think these pro athletes get themselves in trouble? That's exactly. Yeah, I've got, right? a, I've got a couple pro athletes I know and the same thing. And and it's uh, that's why I also put some mindset stuff in here because... Uh, it's proven that when you're poor and you grow up with not a lot, you envision money to be bigger than it is. I mean, you your concept of money when poor kids are asked to draw, hey, draw some money for me. They draw these huge dollar bills and huge coins. And the rich kids, it looks like chicken feed. You know, it's like little tiny things on a sheet of paper. And you're like, what's that? Oh, that's money. You know? Yeah. And it was always there. Yeah, it's always there. But it's it's that, you know, it's stuck in your head. And you either... I talk about the, you know, the abundance and the scarcity mindsets, and I, I kind of got this from, you know, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you know, Robert Kiyosaki, great yep. book, but huge mindset shifter because you start thinking in these ways and you're constrained by that or you're liberated by it. And yeah. You can put a lot of limiting factors you th- on yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, hey, I, I, 
you know, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not educated enough. I, you know, I, why I, would they ever buy from me? Right. Yeah. Yep. Or, or the CEO will never meet with me. Well, guess what? <laughs> they might actually want to meet with you. Yeah. You might be the person that has a, you know, innovative idea that's going to help their company. So you talk about, uh, in your book, sellers for non-sellers. That's another thing that was kind of an interesting topic to me is, um, you know, I hear people say, oh, I'm not a salesperson. But the reality is we're all salespeople. We are. Right? I mean, and we're all buyers and sellers. So talk about that a little bit, that, that mentality. Yeah. It's like, hey, where do you want to go for lunch? Guess what? You're in a sales sales call right there. Right. You know, or what movie do we want to see? Or where do we want to go on vacation? We're always selling. And then everyone has been in this position. Why should we hire you? Uh, and then if you, you know, are successful in business, you want to start your own business, why should we lend to you? You know, you're coming here to get VC money. Why do we want to back you? Uh, you're selling. There's, there, you're selling. And it, sales is just an essential skill that everyone needs yep. something. And we don't teach it enough uh, in school. Nobody goes through high school learning how to sell. But yeah. guess what? You're going to have to sell in your life. Um, someone wants to, uh, you know, they want to close the deal with a, a young lady or, or a guy. You know, if you're a guy, you got to get down on one knee and close the deal and, yeah. and, and say, will you marry, marry me? And, That's right. And you're selling. You know, yeah. so we all sell. Uh, some people do it better than others, but we could all use, you know, a skills refresher on yeah, how that, to get better. That, that's, I am surprised they don't have more, like, official college programs around selling. Another thing, unrelated to selling, but they don't teach finance courses, like basic finance about how to invest. I agree. The time value of money, right? You know, no one ever told me until I started I got to get a little older. And I'm like, wait a sec. If I put this much away for the next... 40 years, this is how much I'm going to have, you know, where do I sign up for that? You know, just very, some basic stuff. No one teaches it. One of the things I was so encouraged by is there are colleges today that have selling programs as part of their marketing curriculum and they do sales competitions. This was foreign to me for about a year ago. And when okay. I was writing the book, I, I got in contact with some of these schools and they're like, you know, um, Illinois, um, Northern Arizona university. They're, they're somewhat of the smaller schools, Southern university, uh, who have these sales competition programs, but they're great because college students get to actually go and present in front of judges. Uh, and I mean, what a great experience to go through college. For me, when I went through college, I got to do academic debate. Okay. So again, same type of thing. Selling, if, yeah. If you, you ever get a chance to do any of these things, do them because they'll be the best courses that prepare you for the future. And I don't care what you're planning to do, those things are going to help you. Yeah. You know, um, you're touching on something that I've, I've told my kids is, you know, public speaking, one of the people's biggest fears. And I, I said to them, you've got to get out of your comfort zone a little bit because you're going to find it's not as bad as you think it is. And it's going to open up more opportunities for you. Right. And one of the things I'll, I'll give you a nugget that I haven't shared anywhere is as a communication major, I put a whole chapter in there about giving presentations and what happens when you connect with people. What's really interesting is that there's a lot that happens when you first meet people and don't take those moments for granted because they're super important. Uh, you have three seconds to make a first impression or less. And when you're coming to meet that person the first time out, there's, there's a lot of stuff that comes with that interaction. There's your history, there's the other person's history, your culture, their culture, all the things and experiences that they've had up to that point and what's interesting is I've talked to, um, you know, people who are neuroscientists and they've told me about what happens at a subatomic layer. Oh, God. And that's really heavy because they're they're talking about, you know, your brain, the, the electrical conductivity. You know, if you ever have those lights where you go touch a light and it turns on, it's because you have capacitance in your body. So there is this magnetism. There's this stuff that happens. It's why you can feel someone's hand close to you if you're in a dark room and there's no lights whatsoever. Right. And people have been blind for life. They can kind of feel, you know, things around them. It's because there's a lot more happening at a deeper level. And my point here is that don't take it for granted. Take, take and do your prep in advance. You want to show up, like you said, you know, public speaking, practicing. Uh, sometimes you'll practice something for hours and hours before you actually have the presentation. Yeah. You know, everyone who's given a sales pitch has known the, this yep. feeling where you're walking around and you're going, 
Furthermore, I'd like to share why we're the best solution for you. Yeah, and I know, and I know you've done this because we all have. How many times you've been in a hotel room the night before, going through, walking in your room with your clicker, yep. going through the PowerPoint, going over and over, you know, big presentation. I, I, I don't know. I, I would think every sales guy's done that at least once in their life. Absolutely, right. and it's those are those are the things that are great about because you learn more in the process. Um, you know. People say practice makes perfect. I like to say perfect practice makes perfect. And and one of my mentors is uh, somebody told me about the 7P principle that I put in the book. And it's called uh, proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes sense. And yeah. he used to, you know, when I was young in my sales career, he, he told me that. And he's like, the 7P principle, this is what you need to know. And I'm like, hmm, makes sense. You know, come prepared. And it's, yeah. and it's stuck with me. I think I read an article once and they, they compared all the best like violinists and all these people that were the top of their field in the world and they all had one thing in common, 10,000 hours of practice. Right. Right. And Michael Jordan even, you know, yeah. they, if you listen to his teammates, you know, he'd be out there shooting hoops way before anyone else would show up. Yeah. And, you know, hours before and just practicing and getting good at what he was already, you know, probably one of the best basketball players that's ever lived, um, felt the need to practice, you know, repeatedly, religiously every day. Yeah, because I, I think th those guys are so driven. You know, there's that whole era of, you know, between Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, oh, you know, yeah. Michael Jordan. That was an unbelievable era in basketball. <laughs> those Olympics were... <laughs> yeah, 92, I believe. If right? you liked watching a lot of U.S. hoops go down. Yeah. You know? So hopefully our, our team this year will continue, but the rest of the world's gotten... Yeah. Gotten on board. They're well, like, we'll, we'll we need see. to practice basketball. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. By the time this is aired, I think the Olympics will be over, but we'll see because they just started. So this will, yeah, so it'll probably be over by then. So another interesting, uh, shifting from the book a little bit, you just went and got your MBA too. I noticed that on your bio. What possessed you to do that? I know. So I want. And you're not 20. I'm not 20. Way, so I'm, I'm at least twice as old as that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I thought about, I'd started my MBA a long time ago, and due to, you know, uh, some family issues and things that happened at the time, I, I stopped it and had always wanted to go back. I'd seen people, you know, get their MBAs, and I was like, well, I've got my MBA in selling. That was my, that was my cop out. Sure. Uh, I'm like, I've got my MBA in selling. I've, I know how to sell. And, uh, but, but, but Microsoft, you know, I work for Microsoft today, and, and they agreed to pay, you know, for some of my MBA. And... I'm like, I really want to do this. I, as a salesperson, as a as a person, I'm I'm into growing and developing. Okay. And I said, I'm going to learn something from this experience, and I did. I went into classes, and um, you know, a lot of people of different ages and backgrounds, and I loved it because if you think you know it all, guess what? That's that's like the nail in your, your coffin. Yeah. You're, you're putting it, uh, but everyone can learn at any age. And I found that having all these experiences as a professional salesperson dealing with business, it just gave me more background to appreciate what I was learning. Yeah. When they talk about something, I'm like, oh, yeah, I've seen that happen at this company. Yeah, I often, I often thought of that. You know, if you go for an MBA right after undergrad and you never have a job, I often wonder, geez, I think it would be go out and work for, us for a few years, experience business, and then you can bring a lot to the table. I'm like, okay, I understand that now. Yeah, I would, you know. I love education, so not to knock it, but I, I think that there's there's something to be said by going out and doing experiential learning and learning on the job. Yeah. And I would totally agree. It made so much more sense to me to go through those those experiences and have some things behind my belt to uh, to then appreciate it. And so now I'm like, oh yeah, I've I've not only graduated with this, but I know how to use it day to day, and I've started using it as I was learning new things. And it's um, it's a it's a rich experience and. Um, you know, I, I wonder that if people go and they're too young, are they benefiting from those experiences and truly leveraging what they yeah. learn? Because it's all theory at that point, right? Yeah. You just all, I mean, granted, you, a lot of those uh, professors are ex-business folks, so they can bring a lot to the table from an educational standpoint, but there's nothing like experiencing it in my mind. Yeah, there's some things that I learned, like uh, organizational behavior. They have these things called the big five, and all HR departments and people know about the big five, but what was beneficial to me is understanding what are the characteristics of salespeople that make great salespeople. And it's things like, we all know these things 
intuitively, it seems like it's like conscientiousness. Am I a hard, hard worker? You know, do I have a good work ethic? You know, how curious am I? Am I, am I open to new ideas? Those are some of the things that represent top performers. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I kind of knew that. But it was validation behind that. Sure. And then learning different nuances of how do I help, you know, grow an organization's human capital uh, in addition to their financial capital. Yeah. Those, th- that was kind of the icing on the cake of why it was valuable. Yeah, I was going to say that kind of leads me into my next question. Is So, you know, you, you go get your MBA and you really do believe that it's helped you in your career because you're, you're in a leadership position. You're not Correct. You're not in a a direct individual contributor role at this point. Am I right on that? Right. Yeah. So my last individual contributor role was when I did the billion dollars in sales. And uh, to give me time to write the book, I decided to uh, to jump into a leadership role that gave me a little bit lighter travel schedule and uh, some focus time to uh, to do both of these things. I just didn't realize they'd, they'd collide at the same period of time. <laughs> so the book launched right when I was in my last semester of my my MBA. It was a little chaotic. Yeah. No, I can imagine. So do you, any regrets writing the book or any regrets getting out of being an individual contributor and going to a leadership position? Because that's a, that's a big one sales guys talk about, you know, do I want a management? Do I want a leadership position? I'm, I like what I'm doing. Um, yeah. I, th- I think that the my career has been defined by I started out in sales, was good at it very quickly. And I'm like, oh, we got to throw this guy into a leadership role. And so I spent, you know, three or four years in a leadership role after I had been only selling for like three or four years. So uh, that was a great experience. I got, you know, some hard knocks there. But then I'm like, forget this. I'm going to go back to individual contributor role. <laughs> and so my career has been, you know, I've, I've had these different roles in different time periods. But one thing that I'll say that's that's valuable having sold, and I wrote a little bit about this in the, in the sales manager suck, is people who are in charge of promoting others into to sales roles recognize that, it's not the best salesperson who's always going to make the best leader. Right. It's, um, you know, sometimes the best sales coach is going to be different than the best salesperson. Uh, and you can have a sales coach. You can have a sales manager. One's kind of operational focused. One's kind of, you know, motivational and, and strategic focused. But think more outside the box of who you put in these roles and why. And then give people the development they need to be successful because they might really want to do this. But they are not competent at doing it. They don't have the confidence needed to to lead teams of the size that, that you're expecting them to. So these are th- some things that I think I've noticed. Uh, yeah. Just what's wrong in you know in sales leadership today. And if you're a, a salesperson in these in these roles, you know, have a little bit of you know of heart and figure out how can I help how can I help make this better. Yeah. Because you know if this is a situation, you might have to go to multiple different people to help make you better. You know, the um, there's many people who have relied on just, hey, this is my sales manager. I'm going to learn everything from them. Well, no. Who's ever done that in life? Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's funny. You get me thinking about, you know, managers. And, you know, I've often, I, I kind of had a theory about managers that the good ones from the bad ones, I always felt the good ones had a certain even keel about them. Poised when the things were going badly. They didn't change when the things were going super well still the same and they, they kind of trusted their style trust trusted their their uh you know their techniques and how to motivate empower educate all that stuff but the ones that weren't so great were the ones that when the things were great <laughs> they were like taking everyone out for drinks but as soon as the number wasn't there they're a tyrant and i just always th- thought that was just such an unattractive style it just right it, it kind of was annoying to me and then even there's there's a whole nother style where people feel they have to be like you know, tough or hard on people. And uh, I'll never forget this. There was a a leader that I met who literally ruled with an iron fist and you were late to his meetings. Forget it. Um, You know, don't bother coming to the meeting is is essentially it. And then one day, you know, after I was no longer, you know, working that closely with him, he revealed, oh, I was just, that's just a show. Yeah. I've heard that before. And I'm like, yeah. That's a horrible show. Well, you know, some of the, <laughs> some of the big companies that we know about, uh, that's the way their leaders are trained, and they're trained. It, it's a I don't agree with the style, but it's hey, you know, you've got your team, you got your top guys. The bottom, there's going to be turnover at the bottom. Just grind these guys. They're going to quit, or you're going to fire them in, in two years, a year. Just get some new in there. I've never agreed with yeah. that style. I, I think it's just a 
you're wasting a lot of time and effort and money trying to rehire and retrain yep. versus, versus try to bring those guys up. But and I was in the military, so I know what that you know, you know what a what a directive style of leadership looks like. Because there are times in the military when they're like, "Hey, we're going to be directive and give you an order, and, and you follow the order. And if you don't, we're sending you to Leavenworth. You know, sure. failure to obey a lawful order. Yeah. You know, so." Um, but what's interesting is they don't see the other side. So people tend to think, oh, I'm going to be like a military general or, you know, whatever. And that's how I'm going to lead. But when I was in the Air Force, I learned some great servant leadership principles from people who were still great mentors to me to this day. Really? And they said, you know, hey, what we do around the holidays is we serve. So, you know, put this apron on. We're going to go into the mess hall. And we're going to cook dinner. We're going to wash the dishes. We're going to serve people. We're going to scoop the food on people's plates. Yeah. And I thought that was very refreshing. And and it didn't end there. But they realized, they're like, okay, we've got all these young people, you know, 18, 19-year-olds with multi-million, billion-dollar equipment that we're entrusting uh, them to. And we're entrusting our lives to them. We need them to function well as, as part of the mission. So we need to make sure that they feel valued trusted, yeah. you know, appreciated. And so these little things of just like, you know, hey, I really want to thank you for what you did there. That was great. Thanks for putting the extra hours. I, I, I appreciate what you're doing. There's so many people yeah, who little don't, pat, don't little, do enough of that. Yeah, a little pat in the back goes a long way, right? It goes a long way. And it's um, it's something I learned in the military early on. People who have this, you know, this, this autocratic style of leadership, they probably never realize that in the military works a lot like that because... Yeah. It, it's it's a band of brothers and sisters, and it's trust. It's yeah. letting you know that you can you know you can trust your life with someone else. Yeah. But you know what's funny to me, Joe, is this still guy with all the information that's out there, with in in in, the, in with social media and everything, all the information that's out there. You would think guys would learn, like you know, being a militant leader. It has never worked. Not right. not in sales. I mean, like you said, there's a time when you have to be hard. If you're going to do this day in, day out and just grind in people, people are just going to quit. Yeah. And now there's like, you know, there's a tremendous amount of places people can go. I mean, everyone, you just look around, everyone's got a job, you know. Yep. We're hiring sign um, yeah. staked out there. So. Yeah. Not not to get generational too, but I think our generation was of the old school of, hey, you got to suck it up. You got to do your time. Well, this younger generation, and I think it's something good about it, is that they won't tolerate that. Yeah, I love it. It's, you know, I kind of, I kind of tip my cap to them. I, I go, I wish I had, I had, I wish I knew what, you know, you guys know because th if they're not happy, they're just gonna leave. Yeah, and one thing that you know, for for seasoned sellers, uh, find some people you can mentor in sales because guess what, you're gonna learn a ton from them. I mean, the way that we're selling digitally, um, socially, you know, social selling is changing the whole fabric of sales. And, yeah. you know, seasoned salespeople can learn from junior salespeople. Junior sales, it, it benefits both both people. Yep. Hey, I'm in that category that I, I just learned something. I just came when I, I released a podcast today on social selling. Oh, that's great. My, my guest was, a, she's a social selling expert. And actually, you know, she was actually my coach for a while. So I learned a lot. So I, I'm i trying to adapt to the times, too. So I'm doing a lot of, uh, the statistic that I heard was 67% of all technology buyers will go three to five times to social media to look for content before they will call a rep. Mm -hmm. So if you're out there socially selling and getting your name out there, hopefully you're creating a brand for yourself. And that's the one thing I took away from that. That was a stunning statistic to me. Yeah, there's, um, so I actually did, like I said, when writing the book, I went and uh, I did a lot of research. And some of the research I came across was um, the way that people buy today. Okay. And so these neuroscientists actually researched what goes on in people's brains. They connected, you know, EEGs and they got brainwave activity. What do people do when, they, when they're going through a buying cycle? And what was staggering about that, like you said, is not only do, you know, 68% of the people go to these multiple touches, but it's like 80% of the people have been further along in the sales cycle than the seller ever realizes because they've gotten tons of information. They've researched websites. So they're at a point now where they're conceptualizing value way before the seller has ever had a first hello. Right. So yep. when they're when they're calling you in and you're like, hey, I want to tell you about what we can do for your company. No, forget that because that's not a good approach. Uh, this person's already, you have to catch up to where they're sure. at. And yeah. so you have to you have to be a little bit of, you know, leading the witness and say, you know, hey, very nice to meet you. You know, tell me a little bit about, you know, you know, what you're doing in this project or this initiative. 
here's what I know about you. Here's something that I can add a value, but you have to map where they're at because yeah. they're so so much further ahead of you already. Yeah. And if you just come in and uh, unload on them, sure. you know, it's it's, it's, it's a, a delicate bet. balance, right? Yeah. I mean, you, just to go in and say, you know, you've got to do everything different than you're doing it today is not going to go. Correct. Yeah. Just, the, telling them their baby's ugly is never a good strategy. It's not a good strategy. Until and... you're ingrained in the account and then you've earned that credibility where you can say, hey, I'm going to have to put a time out on this. Really, what you're doing doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But you've earned it at that point. And I think there's every, you know, everyone in sales or, or in business has gone through something of this where you think you understand, uh, Putnam Investments used to have the slogan, it's like you think you understand the situation, but what you don't understand is the situation just changed. Yeah. And it's true in business because you'll show up into something and you'll be like, oh, I can't believe I just said that or did that. You know, you're palming your face for a mistake that you made and you, you can't go back. You yeah. know, it's it's digging yourself out of those holes. Yeah, it's, we've all done it, though. I it's mean, hard. Yeah, everyone, any, everyone's done it. Anyone who says that, I mean, you know, we've all walked out of meetings going, that didn't go well. Yeah. You know. But sometimes the recovery is is part of the part of the solution. I think being authentic and just saying, you know, hey, that wasn't our finest hour. Yeah. I, I want to thank you for your time, you know, and appreciate you, you, you allowing us to have this time. Would love to have uh, share some things that I think resonate more, whether you choose us or not. And then continuing through, even if they don't pick you, I've had so many sales that have happened because I've sold after I've lost. Yes. And, Big one. you know, right. totally golden thing that I never learned about because you can have someone say, oh, we've lost this thing. And guess what? The bigger deal is something that you don't even know about. Yeah. It's like uh, it's like the Titanic hitting the iceberg. You might have seen this one deal above the water and below the water line. There's a whole lot going on. Yeah, I think I think that's a really good point. I think people, customers will respect you if you you know you come in with your head high and you leave with your head high, right? Thank you for the opportunity. Yep. No sour grapes, and anything you know, if anything can help them in some way, they go like, wow, that guy, you know. And you know, it's that's why selling is so mental. It's because yeah. you have to you have to be impervious to no. When somebody says no or, or what they're saying, you have to have emotional intelligence enough to discern what they mean. It's um, it's they're not saying no to me. They're saying no to this this solution at this time aligning with this business issue. But it's not no for the entire company. Right. This is one person in the company. They can't speak for, you know, everything that this company is going to do in their future. So you have to you have to have at least enough wherewithal to know that, hey, the you know, this they're just saying no right now. And tomorrow's a new day, and there's someone else I can meet in the same company who might say yes, or this might be a good fit. But it's it's like you said, it's that delicate balance because you don't want to be the guy or the or the gal who goes in and just keeps hammering after they're like, no, you know, we really, yeah, this is like the fiftieth no. Yeah, and that's, you know? <laughs> that's, that's definitely a skill, knowing when to back off and when to engage, and you know, it's a tough one. I we all struggle with that one, I think. But I think part of it is you know mapping out and having a having an approach, having a plan to, to what your business is going to do. And and if you believe wholeheartedly, uh, and this is, you know, I remember when the Challenger sale came out, my boss put me in, and he was like, oh, I think, you know, they did this research on sellers, and I was one of the researchees. And so I got to do this whole question on, on, on being a Challenger seller. But, you know, part of that is not being challenging, but it's knowing and having enough passion in what you're doing. Yeah. And if you know what you're doing is right for somebody and can convey that with, with passion and conviction, a lot of people go, wow, you know, that's that's powerful. So, Joe, uh, interesting book. Um, so if someone were to get into sales, wanted to get into sales, what, what would you tell them? A 21-year-old kid out of college comes to you and says, Joe, you've had a successful career, you know, do you think it's worth getting into? What do you What do you tell them? I'd say, hang on for the ride of your life, and then I'd <laughs> and then I'd say, really, you don't know what a great career this is going to be for you because there are so many things. You know, I've started a couple of businesses in real estate. Guess what? The number one skill in those businesses is selling, being able to sell. But it's 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 aligning value with others. Everyone wants to buy. Yeah. Buying is fun. Yeah. Who likes to buy? I like to buy. You know, yeah. all your all your viewers like to buy. Yeah. But um, who likes to be sold to? Nobody. Yeah. You know, if you put a poll out there, and that's where I think people feel that, oh, this is, this is not an honorable career. But it's, it, it helps you unlock a lot of things in life. And I'd say just hang on for the ride of your life because you can do a lot of great things knowing how to sell. It's a critical skill in business and life. And 
you look at find the models who are worth modeling after the people who, um, you know, Byron Nelson, you know, great guy golfer in North Texas. He contributes, you know, to the salesmanship club. You know, that was the Byron Nelson. They, they, and what is that about? You know, salesmanship club. That's you know, salespersonship club. You know, that's that's a great thing because you're adding value to people and you're giving back at the same time. So yeah, I I encourage anyone who wants to get on the board to sell uh, to do it. You won't regret it. Awesome, awesome. Well, Joe, um, if someone wanted to get in touch with you, learn more about the book. How would they get in touch with you? So it's super easy. My name, Peronto. You just have to start spelling it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so the J-Par. A lot of people know me by J-Par because it's easier to spell than Peronto. Social media, thejpar.com. That's my website, www.thejpar.com. You can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, by that. So uh, reach out to me. I will say it's. Uh, I'm completely honored to, to share uh, these ideas with others, but what I get back that that really jazzes me up and i'm sure you run into this a lot in the yep. podcast is when you meet those people and they say you know hey i took these couple of things and here's what i did and it's way better or different than than i would have ever guessed i get supercharged when yeah, people i can imagine respond back i got a um, i got an email from someone in russia and they wrote oh, wow. completely in russian about how i impacted their business and i was first blown away That's because awesome. i i couldn't read it and i was debating with people i'm like why did they send me in russian and then we concluded Cyrillic keyboard. That's all they had. They were like, yeah. I'm, I'm going to write in Russian because it's easier. I, I can't write this English well, stuff. Well, they have all those uh, <laughs> translating programs out there right now. Which, That's what which, I did. I just kind of yeah. copied it and psh, translated Google, it. Google Translate. And, and, you got to love it. And I was able to, you know, to get on that. I, I use Bing. You know, so I'm... I'm <laughs> but anyway, that's what I did, and I, I translated it, and I read it, and I was I was completely humbled by it. Oh, it's a, that's that's a great story. And the cool thing is, there the book is written to kind of help other people write their stories. And you know, you've had some great guests on here. Uh, I encourage people to continue watching the podcast because you have some tremendous things, things that I've learned from people where I'm just smiling, and uh, I'm I'm happy that I got to know you. How I got to, to meet you was was through networking. Yeah, really and, was. And and you know that's a sales skill. Yeah. So uh, so yeah so. Yeah. No. Well, thanks for and and that's kind of the re- reasons on the show I've had. A, I, I don't I don't stick to one topic. I wanted to have a wide variety. I don't want to have guys like you on. I want to have technology folks on. Personal interest stories. It's just been a fun ride, and uh, I'm learning a lot too. You know, it's it's then like I said, learning is always fun. So. Yeah, I love it, and uh, you know, really appreciate it. I I will say that you know, uh, connecting with you is really. Uh, refreshing, you know, other salespeople, but just talking about what it's like to go through this, the, you know, this world together. Yeah. And, oh. you know, I think a lot of people right now, sales is what's going to help our economy uh, get back and rebound. And, and you know, it's it, it's going to be tough for some people for a while. I mean, we're, we've got some inflation and some things yeah. going on, but uh, we always nothing, bounce back. nothing happens until a sale. That's right. I think it was Thomas Watson, or I don't know who claimed it, yeah. but... It's one of those guys. Yeah. One of those guys who, who did that, but it's true. You know, it's, it fuels everything. Okay. Well, I'll close with Billion Dollar, dollar Sales Secrets, Joe Print. You can buy this on Amazon. I encourage everyone to read it. It's a great book. I really enjoyed it. And uh, Joe, again, thanks for being on the show. And that's a wrap of Business Brains in the Bottom Line. Until next time. 